Thank you, Narshinga Rupa Prabhu, for your kind words and your warm welcome. Jai. Om Ajnati Mirandasya Gananjana Salakaya Chakshuram Mitami Natasmai Shri Guri Ramanu The Mom Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pestaya Bhutale Shimadi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nithinamini Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Vashatya Deshatari Nevan Shakalpadra Vishagri Vasana Shabhashna Pinunam Hare Krishna and welcome to our Sunday program. Thank you for coming. We know you have a vast uh, choice of engagements on Sunday. So we are very happy you chose to come here at the Radha Kalachanjari Temple. Anyone is here for the first time? So all, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Are you new to Dallas or you're new to Dallas? Okay, so we hope uh, this will be uh, like a regular uh, stop or regular community for you. So... Today, we also celebrate the Vyasa Puja. Vyasa Puja means the birthday of the spiritual master. In our society, International Society for Krishna Consciousness, we have many spiritual masters. And today, we honor, celebrate, we, we, we remember, His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami. Unfortunately, he is no more. He left us in 2007. But um, he has been, and in one sense he is still, one of the most important leaders of our movement. How many of you ever met him personally? Okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll hear a couple of clips uh, from, uh, from him. I thought of starting from Bhagavad Gita. And I chose... Uh, Bhagavad Gita, uh, chapter 9, text 12. Uh, here Krishna speaks about the bad guys, the bad people. He speaks about the bad people in many places of the Bhagavad Gita. Of course, the Bhagavad Gita is a text for spiritual edification, uh, for regaining our holiness, our purity, but part of that transcendental knowledge is to also understand the mentalities which are not conducive, opposite to that holiness, to that sanctity, to the purity, to that devotion. So I chose a verse in which uh, Krishna is quite you know, heavy. Um, Krishna is very sweet. But it can also be heavy because um, some people are very bad. <laughs> so let's, let's uh, if you like, we can read this verse together or let's do the Prana Mantra. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. So this is a obe a obeisances or pranam to Vasudeva. Vasudeva is another name of Krishna. One meaning is that he is the son of Vasudeva. But the philosophical meaning is that Krishna Kalachanji resides everywhere in full awareness and full control of all his energies. So before speaking, we remember that. Moga Sha Moga Karmano. Moga Gyana Vicheta Saha 
రాక్షసింహాసురిం ప్రకృతి మోహిని శ్రిత ఓకే um translation on purpose by his divine grace as he bhakti danta swami prabhupad those who are thus bewildered are attracted by demonic and atheistic views in that deluded condition their hopes for liberation their fruitive activities and their culture of knowledge are all defeated you may have heard you may have noticed that uh, in the, ver- the verse say three times this word mogha mogha means baffled baffled uh, it's a failure so uh, their hopes hasha their it's it's a failure their karma naha their fruity activity is a failure and their gana mogha gana is also a failure so it's a total fiasco why why this total fi- fiasco because they rakshasim asurim they take shelter in demonic bad ideas bad ideas of themselves or the world or their place in the world and therefore it's all a huge fiasco let's read the purport by shri prapa um there are many devotees who assume themselves to be in krishna consciousness and in devotional service but at heart do not accept the supreme personality of god at krishna as the absolute truth let's pause there see especially in india and it's not an ethnic thing in india because krishna was in india so is more well known in india many people no krishna at least because there are so many tv serial about krishna right at least because of that krishna rama ramayana and so on so they know krishna and they may even say yeah 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 i like krishna i'm a devotee of krishna but if they do not accept krishna as he is as the supreme personality of god as the absolute truth if they only accept him as a, as a like as a myth as a mythological character or even as an historical personality but just a great prince or a great yogi or a great anything but not the greatest the highest and the most uh, powerful entity purushottam uh, in existence and the base of all existence then they are actually misled therefore for them the fruit of devotional service going back to god back going back to god will never be tasted because they don't see krishna as the godhead i hope not to disturb anybody or maybe i hope to disturb somebody but <laughs> i'm just saying this is the bhagavad gita this is what uh, krishna says so we have to repeat even if sometimes it's a little bit too hard to digest similarly those who are engaged in f- f- fruitive pious activities and who are ultimately hoping to be liberated from this material entanglement will never be successful either because they deride the supreme personality of god the krishna in other words persons who mock krishna are to be understood to be demoniac and atheistic as described in the seventh chapter of bhagavad gita such demonic miscreants never surrender to krishna so what does it mean mock krishna they may not even mock krishna directly like i mean uh, uh, you live in america i surmise i assume and uh, you'll see how there are two major parties political parties and 
one constantly mock the other, right? <laughs> and of course, there is a lot to mock in, in, in either party, but it's like a constant thing. It's a constant thing. So the mocking of Krishna may not be like that. May not be that even they say, no, Krishna is not good. Or, but if they don't understand who Krishna is, and they take him as an historical personality, and if they think that there is something higher than Krishna, it's a form of mocking. Uh, therefore, their mental speculations to arrive at the absolute truth bring them to the false conclusion that the ordinary living entity and Krishna are one and the same. Which is absurd. Uh, with such a false conviction, they think that the body of any human being is now simply covered by material nature, and that as soon as one is liberated from this material body, there is no difference between God and himself. In other words, they think, we are small, small, we cannot control the cosmos and time, we can, I mean, we cannot even control our body, right? Uh, we, our body gets old and we cannot really do anything about it. We can try to maintain our fitness, our health, but gradually, 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 our body decays, degrades, becomes old. So we cannot even control our body. What to speak of the world, what to speak of all the planets. But some people, these uh, misled people think, no, 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 it's just because we are covered by some sort of illusion and we think we are very small, but once we go beyond the illusion, then we will be very big. Because we are actually supreme, they think. But if, they, if we were supreme, supreme means on top of everything, right? Supreme, supreme, there's nothing else. If we were supreme, where is this maya? Where is this illusion that covered us? So, obviously, the answer is that we were never supreme. We were always subordinate. This attempt to become one with Krishna will be baffled because of delusion. Such atheistic and demoniac cultivation of spiritual knowledge is always futile. It's always futile because it's based on a false, connection, uh, false conception. It's like when you start a mathematical equation. If you start with the wrong step, everything is wrong. You may be very good, but if you start with the wrong step, everything, pages and pages of formulas, everything is wrong. So some people are very, uh, very expert um, word jugglers, logicians. They break the words of Sanskrit. The Sanskrit means like this. If you take the Sandhi like this, it means another thing. And this means this, this means that. But because the underlying concept, the underlying idea is wrong, everything is wrong. Uh, this is the, that is the indication of this verse. For such persons, cultivation of the knowledge in the Vedic literature, like the Vedanta Sutra, the Upanishad, is always baffled. It is a great offense, therefore, to consider Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God, to be an ordinary man. Those who do so are certainly deluded because they cannot understand the eternal form of Krishna. The Briyad Vishnu Smriti clearly states, Yuvitti Bautikam Deham Krishnasya Paramatmana Sasaravas Madhva Hiskarya Shrautas Marta Vidhanataha Mukham Tasya Valukyapi 
सच्छेलम स्नानम अच्छरित स्नानम अच्छरित when you see the uh, the face of somebody who thinks like that you have to take a bath one who considers the body of krishna to be material should be driven out from all rituals and activities of the shruti and the smriti and if one by chance sees his face one should at once take bath in the ganges to rid himself of infection since we don't have a ganges here in dallas better not to see those faces <laughs> People jeer at Krishna because they are envious of the Supreme Personality of God. Their destiny is certainly to take birth after birth in the species of atheistic and demonic life. Perpetually, their real knowledge will remain under delusion. And gradually, they will regress to the darkest region of creation. Hmm. So this is very unfortunate, but what to do? And... Um, Because of taking shelter in this uh, false philosophy, they, uh, people be become very proud. And proud, pride means that we feel authorized to do anything and everything. Because if you think that you are God, you just forgot, but you're God, then you feel that, yeah, I can do anything, because I'm God. Um, and so people stop being careful in, uh, in how they interact with the world, with the environment, with other people. And uh, they create a situation of great violence. So I want to share a clip from Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj. I repeat, for those who just came, today we... Celebrate his birthday. And uh, so let's hear a couple of minutes. The title, this is a short clip on YouTube, Supporting Violence Whilst Wanting Peace. A leadership crisis, Bhakti Tirtha Swami, Washington, D.C. I repeat, Bhakti Tirtha Swami is not anymore with us. He left in 2007, and today we uh, remember him. So. Any group of people has a significant factor, comes back significantly to a crisis in leadership. And so this is why we're trying to write more and more in these areas and address these concerns from a physical, from a psychological, sociological, metaphysical, and a spiritual perspective. The instruments for communication are so expert, are so phenomenal. But mutual intelligibility, people's genuine ability to understand and to communicate is actually going down because the conflicts are increasing. It's a paradox in our time that we, we want peace. But at the same time, we are doing what? We're having violent thoughts. We are speaking violent words. We are listening to violent music. We are eating violent food stuff, having violent diets. It's very assaulting to our body. We are taking violent drugs, whether illicit or illicit drugs. We're having violent uh, drinks. What to say about violent relationships? What does it say of honoring violent politicians who create violence against themselves, violence against their families, and surely they'll create violence against the, uh, their constituents. So while we are supporting all of this kind of violence, 
we are somehow anticipating peace. It's an obvious contradiction. So we encourage everyone uh, to, to search on YouTube. There are many clips like that, also full, uh, full uh, lectures. Um, we may see another one uh, towards the end. But let's, uh, let's meditate on this uh, concept that there is so much violence at all levels. Hmm? And let's start meditating on the violence at the most basic level, which is the eating level. We all need eating. Our body is designed like that. <sighs> Some energy is uh, uh, expanded, uh, spent, and energy needs to be uh, replenished. So we need food. Hmm? But what kind of food? Bhaktisirtha Maharaj was saying how uh, the food of many people is very violent. It's, it comes from violence. So what does it mean? Let's see some data. This is uh, our world in data. It's uh, a I agree. No thanks. What should I do? I agree. Uh, how many animals get slaughtered every day? There's a little infographic. How many animals get slaughtered for meat every day? These are not yearly data, not monthly data, not weekly data. These are daily data, every 24 hours. 900,000 cows. How many are 900,000 cows? There are a lot. <laughs> but how many there are? If you take a cow, which say is long two meters, and you put one after another in a straight line, it goes from Dallas to beyond Las Vegas. I say Las Vegas because when I came to Dallas, I transferred in Las Vegas, and the flight is two and a half hour long. And so you imagine you get on a flight, you fly over a line of cows for two hours, and that's the cows which are killed every day. But others are even more. 1.4 million goats, 1.7 million sheep, 3.8 million pigs. And please keep in mind that it's not just... Of course, just the killing itself, it's an act of tremendous violence. Just the killing. I remember once I was in Italy and I was uh, distributing books. And I was in a little town in central Italy. And I, I, was, um, I was in my books, my book bag, and I was knocking on different doors. At the end, I, I, I go at the end of the town, and I went to the, uh, there was the slaughterhouse. Generally, they keep it a little outside the urban center, right? So the people don't really see where the food comes from. And they, while I was there, they were slaughtering pigs. Some, some were already quartered, and they were already chained. Huh? And some that were just waiting to be slaughtered. And um, I still remember, this is more than 30 years ago, but it left a deep impression. There was a pig, which obviously was very, very scared because he was seeing what was going on. So he was there, terrified on the ground. And then they had this uh, pistol with this nail that comes out. Hmm? So somebody just came there, like nonchalantly, because they do it every day. For them, it's like you know, plucking at potatoes or something, or, or tomato. And he shot the pig in the head. And that was already horrible. But then two other guys jumped on the pig, 
I don't know. If, uh, maybe I shouldn't say because there are children. But anyway, they killed the pig in a way that I still remember after 30 years. It was like a, a scene from hell. Now, obviously, who eats pig, sheep, goats, cows, and all the other animals, they must be responsible because they are killed for them. Not only that, it's just not the killing. Often these animals, in most cases, these animals are kept all their life in atrocious conditions. They have very little space. They're pumped with hormones to make them fat. Sometimes they go just mad. In fact, chickens, <clears throat> they're kept in such, most of the time, they're kept in such uh, small places then they go mad and they start, mm, what do you call? Beaking? Packing. Packing each other. So they cut their beak. And their whole life is in this small cage. And we'll see later how many chickens are, are, are killed every day. 12 million ducks. You see how the, 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 <clears throat> the numbers go up. Huh? Big animals, 900,000 cows, then 1 million, 4.4, 1.7, 3.8, 12 millions, and then 202 million chickens. That means every average minute, 1,400,000 1, chickens get slaughtered. Every minute. So we started this uh, speech about... 18 minutes ago, who can Google, who has a cal calculator? Not Google, I mean calculator. In 18 minutes, if on average, every minute, 140,000 chicken are slaughtered, 2 million? 2 million. So, in the brief time in which I started speaking, at 515, already two and a half million, more than two and a half million chicken have been killed. So you can imagine the amount of, of karma, bad karma, which has been accumulated. Because this karma must manifest in some way Sometimes it manifests that those who are responsible for all this violence, they also become victims of the same violence. So they're born as chicken, they're born as goats, they're born as pigs. And they face the same destiny. But the whole atmosphere gets surcharged by, by sin. And sometimes when the, the, when the atmosphere is surcharged by sin, even those who are kind of innocent, okay, they may be vegetarian, they get affected. They get affected because the, just like Maharaj was mentioning, violent music. Sometimes you stop at the, uh, at the light, the traffic light, and from the other car comes this heavy, heavy vibe, <laughs> you all have this experience, right? Yes. So, uh, so that's not your choice music, perhaps. I don't know. I don't want to <laughs> comment on tastes, musical tastes, but probably it's not your choice music. But just because you are living in Dallas, you have to hear that music. Okay. No, not okay. Then hundreds of millions of fish, they don't even know how many. They say, um, estimates of the number of fish killed are unfortunately very uncertain. They, they don't know. There are hundreds of millions of fish every day. Okay, so this is the situation. So we shouldn't uh, be uh, surprised when something bad comes. Because something bad is already going on. And it's masked, is masked to create what's called a cognitive dissonance. 
We know that these animals suffer. We know. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to understand that the pig doesn't like to be cut into pieces. So we know, but the food industry masks these truths, for instance, with advertisements. And many, 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 um, if for instance, people who sell chicken, their logo is a very happy chicken. And sometimes they humanize, they anthropomorphize the chicken. You notice that. Very happy chicken, very smiley. Huh? Like in Mexico, I don't know if they have also in Dallas. Pollo loco? You got pollo loco? At least they, they are honest. Pollo loco means crazy, crazy chicken. At least. <laughs> but, but anyway, I'm just saying. It's masked. So if you go to a normal person, say in a supermarket, normal person, and you say, would you kill this chicken? Will you, will you twist its neck? They'll never do it. They'll never do it. But because it's packed, it doesn't look like a chicken even anymore, eh, people, they come inside the supermarket with their dog, which is... Um, honored and, and, and uh, treated like a son, but then they go inside the supermarket and they buy food which comes from violence from other animal. So uh, we can expect a lot of reactions from this. And we are talking just about the eating aspect. There is, we could talk about so many aspects of, of, of violence, uh, wars, or say how we treat the environment, how we, we generate energy, or how we treat each other. Everybody looks for love, everybody looks for partnership, but it seems that the human beings are finding more and more difficult just to live together. In this country, in this country, divorce rate is about 50%, roughly 50%. And the young generation sometimes are so frustrated that they don't even want to get married anymore. Because if so, it's, it's such a difficult thing, why should I try even? And there are countries that are more. In France, it's 55. There is a country in Europe, Luxembourg. The divorce rate is 87%. Luxembourg is a very rich and advanced country. A small country, but half the country uh, is basically banks. So people are very rich and educated and everything. But they can't figure out how to live together. Basically, nine over ten weddings, they end up in divorce. Which is painful. Which is painful because we want connection, we want partnership, we want love, we want affection. We want, but we are not able. So the old society is certainly um, fragmenting in many, many, many ways. And everything comes from the simple problem that we forgot Krishna. We forgot the center. We forgot who we are. Or we think to be something that we are not. The lords and controllers, Ishvara, Ham, Aham, Bhogi. Later the Bhagavad Gita explained the, ma the mind of the unenlightened. Ha Ishvara, Ham, Aham, Bhogi. They think I'm the controller and I'm the enjoyer. And therefore I have a license to do whatever I want. And that brings pain to everybody. That arrogance, that conceit. So I wanted to show a six minute video. Shri Prabhupada speaks. The title is, because I have become a devotee, there will be no danger, no suffering. No, 
<laughs> so we may think, uh, okay, we are devotees, we are innocent, we are vegetarian, uh, but the, so therefore we will not face any uh, difficulty. Mm, sorry to disappoint you. So let's hear from the founder Acharya. Consciousness cannot be disturbed at any circumstances. Even there is heavy suffering. That is the instruction of Kunti Devi. Kunti Devi is welcoming. Vipada Santu Ta Tatrata. Like that. Because before winning the battle of Purukshetra, all these Pandavas were put into so many dangerous positions that is already described in the previous verses. Uh, sometimes they are offered poison, sometimes they are put into the house, where, lap, and it was set fire. Uh, sometimes big, big uh, demons, man eaters, and big, big fighters, every time uh, they lost their uh, kingdom, lost their wife, lost their prestige, they were put into the forest. Full of dangers. But within all those dangers, Krishna was there. With all those dangers. When the Draupadi was being naked, Krishna was there supplying uh, cloth. Uh, Krishna was always there. Therefore, Bhishma, they, while he was dying, he was grandfather of the Pandavas. So when the Pandavas came to see him on his deathbed, so he cried that these boys, my grandsons, uh, they're all very pious. Maharaj Yudhisthi, the top most pious person, is now name is Dharmara, the king of religious. He's the eldest brother. And he and Arjo, their devotees and so great hero. They can kill thousands of men. They're so powerful. So Dujitsi is there. And uh, Bhiva is there. Arjuna is there. And Draupati is directly uh, the goddess of fortune. Uh, there was this uh, Injunction that wherever the Rupati will be there, there will be no scarcity of food. In this way, uh, the combination was so nice. And over and above that, Krishna is always with you. And he's still there suffering. So he began to cry. So I do not know what is the arrangement of Krishna. The such pious man, such devotee, they are also suffering. <clears throat> so don't think that because I have become a devotee, there will be no danger, no suffering. The Pallakma suffered so much, the Pandavas suffered so much, Haridas uh, Thakur suffered so much, but we should not be disturbed by those suffering. We must have firm faith, firm conviction that Krishna is there. He will give me protection. Om tiya pratijani name bhakta pranasati. Don't try to take benefit of other centers than Krishna. Always take to Krishna. Krishna says, Om tiya pratijani name bhakta pranasati. My dear Arjuna, you can declare it to the public that my devotees are never vanquished. Why declaration was advised to be made by Arjuna? Why he did not declare himself? There is some point. Because this declaration, if Krishna makes, there may be violation. Because sometimes he 
violated his promise. But if his devotee promises, it will be never violated. That is Krishna's will. Oh, my devotee has declared this. I must see that it must take his duty. That is Krishna's tradition. He is so much attached to his devotee. Therefore, he said that you declare. <laughs> if I declare, people may not believe it. <laughs> but if you declare, they will believe it. Because you are devotee. Your declaration will never just sub prasada, Bhagavad prasada. Oh, Krishna wants to see that my devotee's promise is fulfilled. My promise may not be fulfilled, may be broken. But this is Krishna consciousness. We must stick to Krishna consciousness in <coughs> all circumstances, even in the most dangerous position. We must keep our faith in Krishna's lotus feet, and there will be no danger. Thank you. Thank you. So, of course, Krishna arranges that the Pandavas, their exemplary devotees, but still they go through so, so much trouble. So we can learn. Because if the great devotees had very peaceful life with no bumps of any kind, then how will we learn? So, there will be dangers, internal, external. Difficulties, that's the nature of this world. And we, we are here to learn to take ultimately shelter in Krishna. And protection by Krishna doesn't mean in an, an ex external sense. Our body will be destroyed at one point. Whether we are Krishna conscious or not, that's the nature of the body. This body will be um, debasing its, its power, its health, its beauty, everything. At one point we'll change the body. But if we take shelter in Krishna, our future body will be spiritual. So no more death, no more disease, no more old age, and no more birth. So we need to take uh, this opportunity of relative peace. There's no real peace in the world, but relative peace for becoming um, strong in our faith. And those who are already uh, strong in their faith, some of you are already strong in your faith, we should do something for others. Because other people are in great danger. They act in such irresponsible ways that they prepare a very, very bleak, very, very tough future for themselves and for the world. So I want to um, end my speech then. If there is a you know, somebody wants to ask a question or two, we have a few minutes left. We'll stop at 6.15. I want to show another clip by Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj, how powerfully he preached, how powerfully he spoke, how boldly. And this is a, a, a march uh, in Washington. Obviously, it's an interfaith situation. Some of the references he gives are from uh, a Christian background, so no, maybe, maybe not everybody will be familiar. And you would see that he was adapting even external, we could say, dress uh, to be able to connect with certain groups that they may may not connect to the typical look of a sannyasi. He was a sannyasi, a very strict sannyasi. You'll see in this clip how he has the Tridanda sannyasi, but you'll see how to connect with people powerfully and make them comfortable with his presence and the culture is presenting, originally from India, of course, he also adopts certain dress, which is, a, we'll say, atypical of Gaudiya Vaishnava sannyasis. 
I want to show this two minute clip just to see his enthusiasm, his boldness. And we can learn that, look, we are in this world and let's, let's try to do something for others. Okay, ready? Bhakti Tirtha Swami, March on Washington, 1993. See his eagerness. There must be also divine intervention. So as I speak, I want to call, help us to remind us about the divine intervention. As we walk today, as we march today, we must march in the spirit of being able to do as when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. As we chant our mantras, as we do our prayers, as we make our toning, as we engage in our scriptural reading, as we engage in our reflections and contemplations, we must be able to invoke divine interventions. Of us, before the day is over, must make vows, personal vows, collective vows, social, religious, political vows of how we are going to make a difference. We must be able to do what? Sometimes we're waiting for the coming again of Jesus, the coming again of Maitreya, the coming again of Buddha. Coming again of the Avatar, the coming again of Baula. We must be able to function so that they are with us now, so that we are able to invoke their blessings now. On this capital, we are the capital of some of the most de situations in the entire global community, and it is causing a problem throughout the inner galaxy of the deprivation of human consciousness. We are at a time now. We must say no more. Private and public life is different. Our private life must be similar to the public life. We must not have a social life, a recreational life, a theological life, a cultural life, and at the same time, at the end of the day, we have no life. We must have soul, and soul means you are my brother, whether you are a woman, whether you are a man. It must not be history anymore. It must be their story. It must be our story. It must not be his story. It must be her story. And when we can have such a situation, we can march and we can bring the walls of Jericho by entering into connecting subtle levels and higher levels, going deeper into our tradition, invoking our prophets, and marching with our prophets, even though we may not see them today. We want to march with our prophets. We want to make this vibration sound throughout the particular planetary situations. Beloved, thank you. So we want to march with our prophets. We want to... Uh, they are sponsoring the Sunday program, therefore we put a <laughs> look. Um, I guess I can close. So marching with our prophets um, is the same idea in our tradition. We follow in the footsteps of the acharyas of the great gurus, the great spiritual masters. Any li anybody likes to ask a question or make a comment? We have a floating mic, two mics. So you can ask two questions at once. Is Antariyami Prabhu going to speak to her? Is she here? Already here? Where is she? Okay. Um, any question from any, anyone? Any doubt? Any disagreement? <laughs> I have a question. In uh, Bhakti Tirtha Swami's, what we just heard from him speaking, you mentioned about walking with our prophets, even though we can't see them. Uh -huh. So I was thinking for us, that means our spiritual masters, uh, Srila Prabhupada, our disciplic succession. And I was just you know, wondering if you could give us some practical advice. How can we do that in our lives daily, walking with them? See, there are two kinds of service to our guru, to our gurus. There is uh, Vapu Seva and Vani Seva. Vapu, literally means the body, and it means a physical service, direct service, say the guru is there, and you can cook for him, you can serve his, his lunch, or you can wash his clothes, and many other things related directly to his physical presence. And that's very, 
a beautiful, very purifying a source of great inspiration and growth. Then there is Vani Seva. Vani means instructions, the words of the Guru. And that's even more powerful and also that's accessible everywhere and every time. The physicality or the presence, physical presence of the Guru, it's a window that opens and closes. Imagine the disciples of Srila Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj, they can't see him anymore since uh, seven, um, 17 years. What to speak of the many disciples here of Thomas Krishna Maharaj. They're also serving in separation, but their vani, their instructions, their words, what they wrote, what they spoke, personal instructions or general universal instructions, those can always and should always stay with us. So the expertise, the sincerity, the seriousness of the disciple is to connect to the body of instructions and constantly meditate on them. And of course we understand that when we connect to the Sampradaya, the Parampara, the Disciplic Succession, we become part of a very large family. It's not just, this is my guru, this is not my guru. <laughs> These are all our gurus. Of course we have a personal guru, our initiating guru, Diksha guru, but they are all our gurus, they are all our instructors, our mentors our uh, benefactors. So this is one of the uh, extraordinary characteristics of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, that we can get benefited and blessed by so many spiritual masters and devotees, not just our own little <coughs> neighborhood guru or something. Hmm? how Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj uh, would say, blessed, blessed by the best, and I won't settle for anything less. We are, we are blessed by the best, huh? but we need to connect those, those, with those blessings. Huh? The books are there. Open the book, that the, the money is there. Our effort should be to avoid distraction. Okay. So, if there is nothing else uh, in terms of questions, we have a special disciple of 